There has been debate over the years about whether the Aegis combat system equipped by the US military can intercept supersonic anti-ship missiles in sea-skimming flight. After all, supersonic weapons are a great threat to surface ships due to their fast flight speed and the ability to skim water. Now the US has released a film that answers this question for everyone. The Aegis combat system can not only intercept sea-skimming supersonic anti-ship missiles, but it can do so easily. On March 27, the US Navy conducted a test of a sea-skimming supersonic anti-ship missile at NASA's Wallops Flight Facility in Virginia. The interceptor was Northrop Grumman's GQM-163 target missile with solid main thrust and ram engine thrust, flying between Mach 2.6 and Mach 3, to simulate a supersonic anti-ship missile attack. The GQM-163 target bomb flew at an altitude of only 4.6 meters during the final segment of the sea-skimming flight. From the film taken by the infrared camera at the site, the GQM-163 target bomb switched to sea-skimming flight mode within seconds of launch, and the camera was only able to capture small dots of light moving at high speed on the sea level. The US military launched two SM-2 standard missiles to intercept from the top down. The first SM-2 missile had already hit the target, and the second had to chase the target that had been turned into pieces because it lost its target. The USS Philippines and USS Mason were the destroyers involved in the test. The USS Philippines has been in service for 30 years and is equipped with the old SPY-1B radar system. But the radar is still more than adequate for sea-skimming supersonic anti-ship missiles. The destroyer USS Mason is an Arleigh Burke Class 2A with an SPY-1D radar system, an improved version of the SPY-1B. For navies, supersonic anti-ship missiles in sea-skimming flight have always been one of the most difficult threats to deal with. Because of the speed of these anti-ship missiles, shipboard defenses have little time to react. In addition, anti-ship missiles in sea-skimming flights can also limit the tracking effectiveness of shipboard sensors. The Aegis Combat System, however, has radar for continuous search and advanced computer systems. It is capable of quickly detecting, classifying, tracking, and responding to a variety of incoming threats. In addition, the Aegis Combat System can link multiple ships, aircraft, and other sensors through a datalink system to aggregate a variety of intelligence information, enabling a more comprehensive response to large-scale attacks. The USS Mason, which was involved in the test, had experienced a live battle in 2016. The Mason was patrolling the Mandab Strait, which exits the Red Sea, when it was attacked by two subsonic anti-ship missiles fired by the Houthis. Mason's Aegis combat system was immediately put into defense mode. The SM-2 and RIM-162 missiles were fired in succession. The incoming missiles were eventually shot down. This was also the first combat record for the Aegis combat system. However, it was facing a subsonic missile, which was much less difficult to intercept than a supersonic missile. Whether the Aegis combat system would be effective against a Mach 3 supersonic missile was not known until the US Army released this test video. Today, countries are developing supersonic anti-ship missiles with increasingly long ranges. For example, Russia's in-service P-800 Onik anti-ship missile can reach speeds of Mach 3. There is also the more threatening 3M-22 Zircon hypersonic missile, which is said to travel at speeds of up to Mach 9 in its final segment and also has some maneuverability to avoid radar detection. In this test, the target bomb has two super capabilities. One is the supersonic capability, while the other is the sea-skimming flight capability. In fact, since the World War II era, countries have seen the stealthiness of ultra-low-altitude flight. Sea-skimming flights can greatly reduce the distance at which they are detected by enemy radar. During the attack on the German Tirpitz battleship, the British fleet of naval aircraft used ultra-low-altitude flight to approach the German warships from the sea. And in the Pacific War, Japanese kamikaze daredevils would ram American troops from ultra-low altitudes. After the end of World War II, the advent of anti-ship missiles made torpedo attacks and dive bombing a thing of the past. Limited by the level of technology, the flight altitude of anti-ship missiles was basically above 100 meters. Although the speed exceeded that of the kamikaze, detection and interception were not as difficult. This is because anti-ship missiles at this time flew too high. Early anti-ship missiles were controlled by barometric altimeters, which were relatively poor for relative altitude and accuracy measurements and were also susceptible to the effects of weather. 
The missiles were also affected by ground effects when flying at ultra-low altitudes. If you choose to force a sea-skimming flight, the missile will accidentally become a torpedo. The core processor of the control system was also very slow, resulting in a very slow response from the anti-ship missile. If you want to avoid some relatively high waves, you will have to keep the flight altitude at 100 meters. It was not until the miniaturization and precise measurement of the radar altimeter came into use that the missile sea skimming flight and terrain matching were gradually realized. At this time, the anti-ship missile can reduce the detection distance of the enemy's naval radar to dozens or even a dozen kilometers, leaving little time for the enemy's defense missile to react. At the same time, the presence of sea surface clutter can also hide the trail of sea skimming anti-ship missiles. When an enemy shipboard radar illuminates an anti-ship missile, the reflected echoes are drowned out by the sea surface's reflected clutter, making it difficult to distinguish the real target. It was not until the Doppler effect was introduced to shipboard radar that the radar frequencies reflected by high-speed incoming objects became higher, making them significantly different from sea-skimming clutter. However, sea-skimming flight is fair to both attackers and defenders. Anti-ship missiles are also limited by the horizon, with an effective range of only 30 kilometers. The initial generation Gabriel missile could only fly within the range of the ballistic radar site. It is not impossible to increase the range to 100 kilometers or more. The first is to use warships or air platforms to provide relay guidance. But this method is a bit unreliable, as ship-based radar has difficulty detecting targets below the horizon. And although the air platform has a good view and can provide guidance for the anti-ship missile, it is also easily exposed to the detection range of the enemy's naval radar. The alternative is to have the anti-ship missile fly under silent conditions to within 30 kilometers of the target and then turn on the radar to search for the target. However, this requires that the anti-ship missile not stray too far from the target during flight. In the absence of GPS, the addition of an inertial navigation system became the only option for the missile. However, the error of inertial navigation becomes larger with the distance and time of flight, and the farther the flight, the larger the error. The radar altimeter solves the problem of the altitude of the anti-ship missile sea skimming flight. The guidance system and turbojet engine solve the problem of range. This makes the sea skimming anti-ship missile really mature. The early Harpoon Block 1A anti-ship missile would leap to an altitude of 1,800 meters at the end and then attack the target with a 7-degree dive angle. This was to allow the Harpoon's guidance system to have greater range and dive to cause more damage to the enemy ship's superstructure, which was filled with electronics and weapons. However, Harpoon later abandoned this method of attack and could instead lower its altitude like a flying fish and aim directly at the target near the waterline allowing for a shorter response time. The advent of sea-skimming anti-ship missiles posed a very significant threat to navies. Therefore, since the 1970s, navies have been trying to enhance the interception capabilities of sea-skimming anti-ship missiles, but so far there have been no successful interceptions in actual combat. However, before countries could verify their air defense capabilities, there was a major technological breakthrough in sea-skimming anti-ship missiles. One of the ideas behind the upgrade of the sea-skimming anti-ship missile is to make it fly faster, boosting it to supersonic speeds. The benefit is obvious, it leaves less time for enemy ships to react, and even if it is eventually intercepted, it can continue to cause damage to the target by virtue of its tremendous inertia. A typical example is the P-270 Mosquit anti-ship missile developed by the Soviet Union which flew at speeds of Mach 2 or more and could also achieve sea-skimming flight before becoming a major problem for the West. The Soviet Union also took the opportunity to mount it on a variety of launch platforms, including sovereignty class destroyers, missile boats, and airplanes. However, the P-270 Mohs kit is not very versatile. The supersonic speed gives the missile a higher probability of successful surprise defense, but the huge air resistance at low altitude also makes the P-270 Mohs kit weigh 4 tons, 5 times more than the Harpoon anti-ship missile. The 553mm torpedo tube is completely unusable for this missile, and even the Soviet Su-33 can only mount one. Even so, its range is only 100 km, which is not even as good as the Harpoon anti-ship missile. So much so that some have described the 7,000-ton displacement Sovereignty class destroyer as a large missile boat. 
Using such a range of anti-ship missiles against the Western countries' carrier battle groups is like suicide. Even so, the advantages offered by supersonic speed are enormous and have been sought by all countries. Anti-ship missiles throughout the supersonic sea-skimming flight can greatly reduce the error caused by the inertial guidance system and also improve the probability of mid-range breakthrough defense. So Russia developed the P-800 Onyx, capable of full supersonic sea-skimming flight, the weight was reduced to 3 tons, and the range was increased by several times, allowing them to be launched on naval aircraft and submarines. In the 1990s, the United States did not choose to develop a full supersonic sea-skimming missile for its own strategic reasons. Rather, it chose to maintain a unified ballistic diameter and reduce the weight of its multi-platform versatility. The potential of subsonic missiles like Harpoon continues to be explored. The Harpoon Block 1B abandoned the leap and dive attack mode. With the subsequent development of Block 1C, the missile could be programmed to avoid offshore terrain cover, hide the location of the launch platform, or allow multiple Harpoon missiles to attack enemy ships from different directions, increasing the overall probability of successful surprise defense. Later Harpoon missiles were retrofitted with a GPS guidance system, adding a data chain to temporarily modify the mission and an infrared guidance head to enhance anti-jamming capabilities. The US also wanted to give Harpoon a secondary attack capability so that it could search for and attack targets again after going off target. While these improvements enhanced the performance of the Harpoon missile, they were not attractive enough for the US at the time. Instead, it was the standoff land attack missile, developed from the Harpoon missile, that really began to be equipped in large numbers. This missile was equipped with an infrared imaging guidance head and a data link system that could adapt to a more complex ground environment while still having the ability to attack the sea. Later, the Slamyar was developed, which is almost a completely new missile except for its diameter and number but still has the capability to attack ships. There is no doubt that sea-skimming supersonic anti-ship missiles are the focus of national development because this type of weapon makes the ship defenseless. This should give a sense of how powerful the Aegis combat system is for intercepting sea-skimming supersonic weapons, as mentioned earlier. The US has also tailored other defense systems for the Aegis combat system. The US Navy has proposed a regional glide phase weapon system program and provided some details of the program at the annual defense planning meeting in 2020. This is an interceptor specifically designed to intercept hypersonic weapons on Arleigh Burke class destroyers equipped with the Aegis combat system. The US Army did not disclose which ships will eventually carry the RGPWS but said the interceptor is designed to be able to be installed in the negative 41 Malawi and Kwacha's vertical launch system. The U.S. Missile Defense Agency began development in 2021 to conduct an analysis of the Aegis combat system to determine initial options for interceptor glide phase weapon control and integration, including the physical and software modifications required, the system design gaps needed to incorporate the Aegis combat system. The U.S. Navy's Missile Defense Agency plans to test the SM-6 missile's ability to intercept hypersonic targets in FI 2023. Public information on the RGPWS is still limited, but its primary purpose is to defend against unpowered hypersonic glide vehicles, not hypersonic air-breathing missiles. The name Regional Glide Phase Weapon System already suggests that the weapon will be a regional weapon system that will defend against the hypersonic glide vehicle threat in each of the US military's delineated theaters of operation. With this in mind, it is easy to see why the US would integrate this defense system into a ship carrying the Aegis combat system. This is because surface ships offer the additional flexibility of being able to quickly reposition themselves during combat and also occupy positions closer to potential launch areas. This is an important consideration when defending against hypersonic weapon threats, which can span long distances in a relatively short period of time. The U.S. Missile Defense Agency has indicated that future space-based hypersonic and ballistic tracking sensor systems will support the regional glide phase weapon system. These satellites will be put into orbit as soon as possible and will be able to detect potential enemy hypersonic weapon launches and then signal other sensors, such as those at sea and on land, for continuous tracking. The U.S. hypersonic weapon construction will be based primarily on existing missile defense systems, which will be improved and redeveloped in a way that will eventually lead to an integrated defense capability against hypersonic weapons and ballistic missiles.
In addition to improving existing systems, the U.S. is currently developing hypersonic and ballistic tracking space sensor satellites, the Hypersonic Defense Weapon System, and the Glide Breaker Program. This year will be a critical phase in the enhancement of the U.S. military's sea-based defense capabilities, when hypersonic and ballistic tracking systems will also reach initial operational capability. The first missile with simultaneous air defense slash anti-hypersonic missile, anti-missile, and anti-ship capabilities may be the SM-6 Block 1B missile, which has attained initial operational capability and may be prepared for anti-hypersonic missile testing.